At the 2022 World Cup, Morocco shocked football fans all across the globe by making it to the semifinals of the competition, becoming the first African country and Arab nation to make it that far. The reason why it stunned everybody wasn't just about getting that far though, it was the fact that they accomplished this task by defeating world class European countries at the World Cup, like Belgium, Spain, and Portugal. However, Morocco hasn't always been this good at the sport. In fact, in the past 10 to 15 years, Morocco has struggled a ton and weren't even one of the top African sides. So how did Morocco go from being a down bad national team to becoming one of the best international sides in football? Well, let's take a look at how exactly Morocco shocked the world. To state how dire the situation was for Morocco, let's go back to 2009, where Morocco was competing to qualify for the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. However, in the qualifiers, Morocco managed to draw three of the games and lose the other three, meaning that they finished at the bottom of Group A of the qualifiers. Not only did this mean that they missed out on making the World Cup in their own continent, but since they performed so badly, they missed out on the next Africa Cup of Nations since they finished dead last in a group with Cameroon, Gabon, and Togo. In fact, Morocco's only win in 2009 was a friendly against a poor Angolan side, really showing how awful Morocco was at the time. Now this was the third consecutive time that Morocco failed to qualify for the World Cup, and they made it four times with the failure of qualifying to the 2014 World Cup, after finishing second in their qualifying group, meaning they missed that automatic spot to Brazil. So where did Morocco's one loss come from that cost them of making it to the World Cup? Well, it was a 3-1 loss to Tanzania, a country at the time that had very little football infrastructure, and also a country that has never qualified for the World Cup before. Morocco was most definitely in the mud. Anyways, when Morocco failed to qualify for the 2010 World Cup, they were roaming around 95th place during that year, behind national teams like Mozambique, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Cape Verde Islands, etc. Then, after failing in 2014, they were 74th place, behind countries like Sierra Leone, Jordan, Libya, etc. Clearly, football in Morocco was at an all-time low, and something within the country's football infrastructure desperately needed to change, if they wanted their country to do better in qualifying and at international competitions. And a change indeed happened. That's because the richest person in Morocco, and also the king of Morocco, Mohammed VI, was a pretty big football fan, and his interest in the sport was a pretty big reason why Morocco was able to bounce back from their recent misery. Basically, the Royal Moroccan Football Federation, more commonly known as the FRMF, was already pretty passionate about improving football within the country. It was just the fact that they lacked resources, mainly financial, and facilities to change the dynamics of Moroccan football. That's when the Federation themselves reportedly approached Mohammed VI personally and asked if they could receive some funding from him to improve the state of the game in Morocco. And Mohammed VI obliged. That's when in 2009, King Mohammed VI opened the Mohammed VI Football Academy in Saleh, Morocco, a place very close to the nation's capital of Rabat, with the purpose of evolving football in the country and help football players reach their goals of playing in a professional league. This football facility, which cost around $16.8 million to build, did indeed help develop some of Morocco's finest talents, while also hosting the Moroccan national team's training sessions whenever they were playing at home. The Moroccan Football Federation did more than this though, because as the years went by, they made similar academies throughout the entire nation, like in Agadir, Tangier, Saida, etc. The reason why these academies spread throughout the country was so that the Moroccan Federation wouldn't overlook a talented player just because he wasn't near the capital where the main facility was located. A smart move by the people in power in Morocco. Not only did these academies try to develop young Moroccan footballers into top prodigies, but they even provided education and mentoring, even implementing a sports study curriculum. So just in case a Moroccan child doesn't become football's next biggest star, they can still fall back on education and find a job with that. This is something English academies still lack to do. So big up to Morocco, they're doing it right. Now this Moroccan academy system has already been deemed a massive success. This is due to the fact that there are some top professional footballers from Morocco that have came through the Mohammed VI Football Academy. Some of these include Abdel Akbar, a center back playing for Deportivo Alaves, Azadine Onahi, a midfielder for Marseille, Naif Aguerd, a center back playing for West Ham United, and Youssef El Nasiri, a striker for Sevilla. Three of the players I just mentioned as well were called up to represent Morocco at the 2022 World Cup and played an important part in their country's success at the tournament, evidently showing that the Moroccan academy system is working. Also, it's not like they stopped building more academies either, because in 2019, the biggest football complex in Africa, Mohammed VI Football Complex, was opened and will definitely play a very big part in developing more Moroccan footballers in the future. Now, developing talent in Morocco isn't the only thing the Moroccan Federation has been focusing on to bring the country back to their best. In fact, there's reportedly a whole sector in the Federation that's completely focused on finding dual national players in football and to follow them and try to convince them to represent Morocco. Dual nationals are basically players that have the eligibility to represent more than one country. Anyways, Morocco has done a fantastic job at recruiting players that can represent Morocco in another country. In fact, at both the 2018 and 2022 World Cup that Morocco made, most players on the squad were born and raised in another country, mainly other European countries that have Moroccan heritage and were willing to represent their homeland. With this, almost all of Morocco's top players are dual nationals. For example, Hakimi was born and raised in Madrid, Spain, with him playing for the Spanish U teams, but later switched to Morocco. Hakim Ziyech was born and raised in the Netherlands and played for the Dutch on their U teams, but made the switch to Morocco as well. Romain Saiz, Morocco's captain, is born and raised in France, and so is Buffon. Amrabat was born and raised 
raised in the Netherlands, and Mizrahi is too. Bono was also born in Canada, etc. Moroccans are passionate about their ethnicity and heritage, and with that, along being convinced by the Moroccan Federation themselves that they want them, these players made the switch to represent Morocco internationally. Let's get back to the football though. How did Morocco turn things around after their failure of not qualifying for the 2010 and 2014 World Cup? Real quick before we get on with that though, please remember to subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it and it means a lot, so thank you. And also if you guys can, follow my Twitter and Instagram, both at Nabuto, if you just want to hear my thoughts on football games, transfers, and overall, just to get to know me more. So if you want to, feel free to hit me up with that follow. Thank you. Well, after 20 years of not making it to the World Cup, Morocco finally qualified for the tournament in Russia 2018. In fact, they even had their sweet revenge against the Ivory Coast, the team that qualified for the 2014 World Cup ahead of them. That's because in the final round of qualifying for Africa, Morocco ended up top of the group with Ivory Coast finishing in second. And this is all thanks to the last game day where Morocco beat Ivory Coast away from home 2-0. This brought Moroccans all over the world joy, and even the players as well, knowing they finally broke the curse of qualifying to the World Cup. However, at the tournament is a different story, because Morocco finished dead last in their group. Their best chance of making a statement at the tournament was by being the easiest opponent out of the three, Iran, with all due respect. However, right when Morocco were going to get a point in the 90 plus fifth minute, Buhadouz, a Moroccan player, headed the ball into his own net, securing three points for Iran. Heartbreaking for Buhadouz for real. But this pretty much secured Morocco's fate because their next opponents were Portugal and Spain. Now against Portugal, Cristiano Ronaldo's early goal silenced them and ended up being a one-nil defeat for the Moroccans, knocking them out of the competition. This means that against Spain on the last match day, they had nothing to play for. Despite this, they ended up playing a very good game and drawing 2-2 and in fact almost beating them if it weren't for VAR giving Spain their late goal. This is also where the iconic Amrabat clip of VAR's bullshit came to life as well. Overall though, it was a disappointing World Cup performance from Morocco, but the fact that they qualified for the tournament after 20 years, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. For the next World Cup cycle for Morocco, the federation appointed Vahid Halil Hosic as the new manager of the senior team. He was an experienced manager, with him winning the CAF Champions League with Raja Casablanca in Morocco, spending two years managing French giants PSG, and guiding Algeria, another North African country, to the World Cup round 16 in 2014 for the first time ever in the country's history, with them even putting a good fight against eventual World Cup champions Germany, with the European country only managing to defeat Algeria in the very last minute of extra time. Now speaking about Halil Hosic's time in Morocco, he did a pretty good job at getting results. That's because in the penultimate round of African qualifying, Morocco won 6 out of the 6 games they played against the likes of Guinea, Sudan, and guinea Bissau, and this led them to having a home and away game against DR Congo in the final round of qualifying to see who makes it to Qatar. With Halil Hosic at the helm, Morocco easily swept DR Congo, beating them 5-2 on aggregate, qualifying for the 2022 World Cup. On the pitch, Halil Hosic was almost flawless, and definitely was flawless in the qualifying campaign. However, he was sacked three months before the World Cup, which is when Wali Regrogui, an ex-Moroccan international player born in France, took charge. So why was Halil Hosic sacked when he was getting results for the Moroccan national team and even got them qualifying for their second World Cup in a row in the 2000s? Well, that's because there were some tensions between Halil Hosic and the Moroccan Federation, where reportedly the main issue is having a fallout with some star players. You see, Morocco's best player going forward, Hakim Ziyech, and one of their best defenders, Mizrawi, essentially retired from the Moroccan national team. That's because Halil Hosic excluded both of these players due to apparent attitude problems and other disciplinary reasons. And with these two players being disrespected, they never accepted any call up again. In fact, the FA chief of Morocco, Fuzi Lecha, urged Ziyech to come back to the national team, but Ziyech denied the call up and even posted on Instagram apologizing to the fans, essentially hinting that as long as Halil Hosic was the manager, he wasn't going to play for the country. Now, it would be insane for Morocco to pull up to the World Cup without their best attacking player, Hakim Ziyech, and also potentially Mizrawi. So, with these tensions, Morocco thought it would be best to sack Halil Hosic just so their star players would feel comfortable and come back to the team. Hey, you US soccer, y'all should probably take some notes on this. Just saying. Anyways, back to topic. Walid Regrogui was selected to be the manager of the national team three months before the World Cup. Now, Walid was not a new manager in the game, with him managing the likes of FUS Rabat, helping them achieve their only league title in 77 years, winning the Qatar Stars League as the manager of Al Duhail, and then went back to Morocco to manage Wydad AC, helping them win the double, the league title, and the CAF Champions League. So, with Walid Regrogui's accomplishments in the region, and with him also being a previous assistant coach to the Moroccan national team in the past, he seemed like the man that could help Morocco do well at the tournament on short notice. Sports journalists thought otherwise though, with him being heavily criticized on what he would be able to do with Morocco at such a short notice. But after the 2022 World Cup concluded, yeah, I bet they all quiet now. Now, Walid was going into the World Cup with only managing three friendlies for the country, a 2-0 win against Chile, a 0-0 draw against Paraguay, and a 3-0 win against Georgia. Two wins and one draw? Not bad. Not only that though, Walid did something Halil Hosic couldn't, and that's convincing the star players to come back on board, meaning that Ziyech and Mazrawi were back in the picture for Morocco. 
happy to accept call-ups again. Wu Lee did face some difficulties in selecting his World Cup squad though, with him needing players that were fit and mentally strong enough to play in his running tirelessly style of football, and players who would run for each other and die on the pitch for each other if they had to. Sadly, some of his star players in his tactics got injured. For example, Amina Herrett, who got injured while playing for Marseille in the last match before leaving for Morocco for the World Cup. There was a decent replacement though, in Zaruri, who was convinced to switch from Belgium to Morocco, but overall, Walid faced difficulty in selecting his roster. Regardless though, the 26-man squad was selected, with 14 of these players being born and raised somewhere other than Morocco, and now they were finally on their way to the World Cup. Now, Morocco is being heavily doubted by football fans and critics all over the world on how they'll perform at the World Cup. In fact, EA Sports didn't have Morocco making it out of their group, the University of Oxford had Morocco finishing dead last in their group, and including me. I also said that Morocco is getting last in their group as well. I didn't know ball back then, but now I do. Anyways, despite Morocco being heavily disrespected by everybody, the squad's mission was clear, to do everything possible to try and win the World Cup, even if that means you're running yourself to the ground in every match. And that's exactly what they did. Despite players dropping like flies throughout this tournament because of injuries they sustained, like Mazraoui being structured off, Amrabat injecting himself with painkillers to continue playing, and Romain Saiz, their captain, wrapping his leg every game until he had to get stretched off in the knockout rounds, the team was giving it all for their country to go as far as possible. And these players' sacrifices did not go in vain, because Morocco shocked everybody during the group stages. They had a pretty dead nil-nil draw in the first match against Croatia, the runners-up of the last World Cup, but one point in the first game isn't bad. Then in the second game, they had to go against Belgium, one of the top-ranked countries in the world of football, the third-place medalist at the last World Cup, and one of the heavy favorites to win the 2022 edition. Morocco weren't phased by this though, and they were confident in their abilities. So confident that they came up with a massive 2-0 win against favorites Belgium, getting a huge three points. This was one of the biggest surprises and upsets of the tournament. Then in the last game, they had to win against Canada, a young, talented team, and that's exactly what they did with them winning 2-1. So not only did Morocco go undefeated in the group stages, but they also qualified to the knockout rounds as the winners of the group, and also with them not conceding a single goal at the tournament so far. Well, they actually scored an own goal in their game against Canada, so they didn't concede a real goal in this tournament so far. That's what I meant to say. Then in the round 16, they played a country that has deep connections with Morocco, Spain, who got second in their group thanks to Japan having one hell of a group stage run as well. Now Morocco weren't at all the favorites, and their dream run was going to end according to many people, except me, because I said Morocco were going to pull off the upset, and indeed they did, just not with that 2-1 scoreline of course. In the game, Morocco allowed themselves to be dominated by Spain, with them losing out on possession by a large margin. However, even with that, Morocco had more shots on target within the 120 minutes, even though Spain's opportunity was closer to going in the net. However, after a 0-0 draw within 120 minutes, the game was set to penalties, and that's when Morocco, and Bono in particular, kept Morocco's record of not allowing goals to go in by an opposition player of this tournament. That's because Bono, and the post, kept every single penalty from Spain out. And with Hakimi's Panenka against the country he was born and raised in, Morocco were through to the quarterfinals, where they were set to play Portugal. Now, Morocco kept that same sort of game tactic against Portugal, where they were going to be on the defensive and hit on the counter, or if Portugal gave them any opportunities. And Morocco got one glaring opportunity towards the end of the first half, where Diego Costa, the Portugal goalkeeper, made a huge mistake by diving for the ball, and Ennis Siri pulled out his inner Michael Jordan and dunked on his head top to give Morocco a 1-0 lead, something they'll salvage until the game ended, knocking out Portugal and Cristiano Ronaldo from his likely last World Cup ever. However, in the semi-finals against recent World Cup champions France, Morocco changed their game plan slightly to try and contain Kylian Mbappe, with them going to a back five. Sadly, it didn't work out so well, with Morocco losing to France 2-0, despite having great opportunities to score in the first half and even the second half way later into the game. After this though, Morocco were sadly knocked out of the World Cup, when pretty much all of Africa, Middle East, and the Muslim world were rooting for them. They did make history though, with them being the first African and Arab nation to make it to a World Cup semi-final, so Moroccan players can keep their head up high, and they have. Side note, they also lost to Croatia in the third place game, which sucks because seeing Morocco win the third place medal would have been so sick. But anyhow, Morocco's accomplishments at this tournament will never be forgotten. The national team of Morocco has inspired an entire country, continent, and every Muslim out there as well that they can compete with the big dogs from Europe and South America, and that those two continents are no longer going to be the only ones dominating the world's game, and that Africa will be able to stand toe to toe with them. Overall, with Morocco's amazing performances at the World Cup, I've been heavily inspired by their run, and ever since they made the semi-final, I've been very intrigued and interested with the Moroccan national team, and how they're going to progress in the future. Morocco seem to have at least one or two World Cups within them with this golden generation, though with them being the heavy favorites to host the 2030 World Cup, alongside Spain and Portugal, Morocco have a good chance of going far in the world's tournament once again. And as a neutral, I could definitely see myself rooting for Morocco to go on a crazy World Cup run yet again. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to subscribe, I would really appreciate it. And also, if you guys can, please follow my Twitter and my Instagram, the links are in my YouTube description. Last but not least, if you want to learn about an upcoming superstar in football, Lamine Yamal, who also has a Moroccan ethnicity, you definitely want to check out this video right here, you won't regret it.